You know, 15 years ago, it was the early days of distance education. And I used to tell a joke. In fact, it got picked up by Business 2.0, which was that distance education is really like teenage sex. Everyone says they're doing it. Most of them aren't. And those that are, aren't doing it well. <laughs> but you know what? It's 15 years later. And we really do it well now. Distance education, at the early days, the technology didn't work. The professors didn't know how to teach. The materials weren't appropriate. But now, actually, 15 years later, universities around the world are doing it well. So what's the problem? The problem is that the university system can't accommodate the crush of students seeking higher education. I'll give one example. In Nigeria, 88% of Nigerian applicants to higher education have no space available to them. There's no space for 88% to apply. This problem is getting worse. So, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, the current rate of admission is 6% to higher education. But it's, going, it's increasing. Actually, it's the fastest-growing uh, um, fastest rate of entry into higher education in the world today at 9% per year. But we have about 160 million students right now. But in 15 years, we're going to have 260 million. So the question becomes, how are we going to build two universities of 30,000 students each, each week for the next 14 years? UNESCO calls this a massification of education. There's a second problem that comes out of this. First of all, we should remember that universities used to be only elite systems. So over time, they've been changing to educate larger and larger numbers. And in fact, to solve the problems of the world, we need systems of mass higher education. But as more and more students have come in at an accelerating rate, we don't even have enough professors to teach them. So distance education can be seen as the first way that we responded to the increased numbers of students. It's a partial response. And as I said before, we do it well now. There's distance education in every spot imaginable on the earth. The African Virtual University provides distance education in, uh, to 50 universities throughout Africa. And they find that some of their university partners don't have an internet connection. Well, there's the satellite link right there. They find that, that they don't have electricity. There's the generator. They find that professors don't have the training and that the professors themselves have to begin to write materials for the African students. There's the training they provide to the professors in Zambia. And here's the result. The result is that students here in Mozambique are able to learn at a distance in a computer lab. Four one year after completing a program for secondary math and science teacher preparation, the African Virtual University has 4,000 students enrolled throughout Africa in this program. So let's stop for a second and think about what we really need. We have to begin to imagine a world in which anyone could learn anything, anywhere, anytime, for free. And this is the promise of open education. The Open Courseware Consortium has a website in which its 250 members post their 18,000 courses. So it's, we're beginning to build the infrastructure. I should say that we're in the early days of open education. We're beginning to build the infrastructure. It doesn't quite work yet. But we're beginning with projects like this to let anybody say, I want to study chemistry give me a list of all the courses you have available in chemistry and let me select from them. Okay, so we're beginning to see that that course catalog has courses associated with it that we can walk in and watch and be there. But there are other barriers to open education and to higher education. Textbooks cost a lot. 
in fact, textbooks cost more in Latin America than they do in the United States. And American students are screaming loudly about the cost of textbooks. So we can now say one of the legs of this uh, open education movement has to be the provisioning of free or low-cost textbooks throughout the world. Well, you can marry that course from University of California, Irvine, to the organic chemistry textbook that was produced by the African Virtual University. And there's many more open textbooks on virtually every subject you can think about. Again, we're in the early days, but this is accelerating as well. OK, so we have content. And we have the textbook problem where we know how to solve it, at least. But you know, learning is social. We learn from each other. So we have to say, what do we do to allow people to learn as part of distance learning in social groups, but as part of open education to make that freely available to everybody. So here's an, here's an initial project that now has a community of about 30,000 associated with it. We started with seven courses two years ago. Now there's over 100. We started with 70 uh, participants, and now we have 30,000. Think of it as a global study hall, or another way of looking at it is, as a web community, if Wikipedia is about information and content, P2P is a Wikipedia of learning. So, you know, we teach introduction to biology in every country across the globe at every university. Introduction to biology is frankly the same, or it, it better be the same. Why can't the students in, in that biology course have 24 by 7 support from a cohort that's working on the same subject at the same time. So peer-to-peer -peer university is trying to think through these issues. And they know that learning is more than about a single course, an individual course. It's about a path. It's about taking a learner from point A to point B to realize their dreams. That's, that's what point B is. So P2PU has started schools the idea of schools. And the first school they did was with the Mozilla Foundation, and it's called the School of Webcraft. And it began with about 35 courses uh, and hundreds of students. But think about why this is a great thing. First of all, if you want a computer science degree, you aren't going to get the courses that are offered here, which are in CSS, HTML5, open web standards, these courses may actually be more appropriate to somebody who walks in the door and asks for a job in a web enterprise because they're teaching the technologies in use now. And that's the other part about peer learning, is that it's besides the, the, uh, the individual courses that somebody is taking, there is a, a community at all time and a school like this can actually make it possible for somebody to get a job in the future. But also we need to transfer it to university credit. Let me give an example where this is already happening. In uh, Indonesia, Apticom is a consortium of, uh, uh, of IT departments at uh, uh, universities, at 170 universities. They had lots of open courses, and they found out there was a problem that nobody was taking these, uh, uh, was using these courses, that there was no use. They had content and no users. What they did, and this was brilliant, is they said, you can transfer open learning to university credit. Why was this important? Because all of a sudden, the government said that 30% of the degree could consist of open learning. And the number of users just took off in Indonesia as a result of this. How do they make that transfer university credit? How do they know that somebody's learned something? They gave them a test. So knowledge assessment becomes important as a mechanism of testing what somebody has learned through open learning. And P2PU is doing a similar kind of thing in a different way. They're handing out badges. So for example, in our example, in our example of the web industry, it's more than knowledge. It's more than skills in PHP. It's actually the ability to work in a group and to make contributions. And so they hand out badges 
for knowledge, skills, and attitude. And who decides these things? At P2PU, the course organizers decide on how a course is offered or whether a course is offered. The, course, the class participants, not students, the participants, the peers, are working with each other to award points in the class and to award those badges to say this is something that was a really excellent contribution. And if we think about this future where it's all available all of a sudden, we have to think what is the future of the university? The way I see it is there's going to be a formal sector and an informal sector. And they're going to play off against each other in a healthy way. First of all, peer learning, it turns out, is more effective than lectures. In studies, in 15 separate studies of science, technology, engineering, and math education, they found consistently that peer-led teams were more effective than lectures. So all of a sudden, we see that peer-to-peer -peer university can make a contribution in terms of the style of pedagogy to the university itself. Universities aren't going to go away. First of all, they perform the research function, and that's absolutely a critical function, and it's not going to go away uh, anytime in the near future. What will change is the idea that we're going to get people up who will just be presenters of content of the same Introduction to Biology class that's already been presented 10,000 times. So this is now a way in which the university works this way. You have your friends in your classroom, and you're working with them in class. Instead of listening to me, you're all together in groups, and we've got applications of what you just learned. We've got uh, case studies that you're uh, discussing. And then, when you go home, there's your group outside the university that's ready to work as well when you don't understand something. You contact them for help. You maybe set up an hour where everybody will be working at the same time through video conferencing. So the question I have now is you have to think of yourself 10 years in the future. And you have to ask yourself, what's your future educational path? And how would you go about starting to take advantage of open education as your own educational path. Thanks very much.